The Center for Educational Media and the College of Education at Middle Tennessee State University are proud to offer professional development to K-12 educators in Tennessee through our online video library. These videos are aligned with standards set by the Tennessee Department of Education. For more professional development videos, check out our website at cem.mtsu.edu. So, yay, we as Tennesseans, now there are lots of really great Tennessee stories where you can talk about, well, this happened in Tennessee, and connect it to the larger national story. So this is a really great way to do like local history tied to uh, larger national movements. And so this is where Tennessee gets to be, hey, we provided the vote, the last vote that was needed in order to ratify this amendment to the Constitution. So you're welcome. Okay, so this starts off by establishing some context of what's going on in Tennessee as far as the women's suffrage movement. And this building down here is the Hermitage Hotel, which is in Nashville. And do you know anything about the Hermitage Hotel? Isn't that, isn't that the one right across from the Tennessee Public Yards? Right, or like that? Yeah, it's like right downtown, close to TPAC, close to the State Capitol building. It's very, very fancy and expensive. Uh, but if you ever go in, apparently, uh, I don't know about the men's bathroom, but the women's bathroom is very pretty. So at least go in the lobby and go see the women's bathroom, right? Yeah, the men's um, is too. Huh? The men's is too. Hey, Smith. Come in. No. No. It was uh, built between 1908 and 1910, so it still would have been relatively new. Uh, during the, the women's suffrage uh, movement. And it was, uh, it's a very grand building, a very uh, accomplished architect uh, designed it. And there were lots of political gatherings that occurred here. Um, and so the most significant one was in 1920, when supporters and opponents of women's suffrage both used the hotel as a headquarters for their campaign to sway the votes of state legislators. So imagine that, they were both headquartered in the same fancy hotel. I wonder what, yeah, I wonder what the, the, the elevator talk. Yeah, the, the awkward elevator talk was like there. Okay, um, so it's, it's nice to be able to kind of connect it to an actual space um, and you could, uh, go into Google Maps and show your students, you know, what it looks like today. And these, by the way, all have entries. They're linked to through the, the lesson idea. Entries on the Tennessee Encyclopedia of History and Culture. Has anyone used that resource for your teaching? Yeah. This is a, an online encyclopedia of anything that has to do with Tennessee history and culture. Um, anything from, you know, the Civil War to Graceland to Justin Timberlake, you know. Um, so it's a really, really great place to go. Check it out before you go to Wikipedia. It's written by different scholars from across the state. So the person who wrote the Hermitage Hotel entry, for example, is my boss, Carol Van West, the Tennessee State Historian and Director of the MTSU Center for Historic Preservation. And the other two articles on Josephine Pearson and Anne Dallas Dudley were written by Carol Busey, who is a professor at Volunteer State Community College up in Gallatin. She's really great. So remember that we learned a little bit about these two ladies at the beginning during the icebreaker session. Did anybody remember uh, who Josephine Pearson was and who Anne Dallas Dudley was? I think Josephine was against the state. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's right. Josephine Pearson was leader of the anti suffrage movement in Tennessee. Now, she was born in Gallatin, but she grew up in McMinnville. 
and she got a she went to Ir Irving College and then she got a master's degree from Cumberland College in 1896. She's extremely well educated for a woman at the turn of the century. All right, so this is not just some ignorant woman from the country who doesn't know what she's talking about. She definitely knows what she's talking about. And um, she was also on the woman's board of the Tennessee Centennial Exposition, uh, which was the huge 1897 celebration where the Parthenon was built for it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, she also uh, participated in the Dixie Highway Council. And the Dixie Highway was an, like the most important road uh, built before the era of interstates. It went all the way from Miami to Chicago, and there's several segments that still go through Tennessee. Um, we actually, it goes right through Murfreesboro. Um, and uh, so it, was, it took a lot of organization to get that thing paid for. Um, okay, so when Governor Albert Roberts called a special session of the Tennessee General Assembly to ratify the amendment in 1920, Pearson came to Nashville and worked actively during July and August to defeat the amendment. And so she was one of the people who was camped out in the Hermitage Hotel. Okay, and so when she lost that fight, she became dean of the Southern Seminary of Virginia, where she also taught history and philosophy. She's buried in Mont Eagle. Um, so an accomplished woman, uh, but I guess you could say on the wrong side of history. You know, we, we can say that now, but, uh, but it's important for students to recognize that she wasn't doing this because she hated, you know, women's rights. Uh, a lot of women were against women's suffrage because they thought um, it actually would drag women into a sphere that would, that would negatively affect their standing in society. It would take away some of their moral authority becoming, you know, from uh, being a home, you know, the from their place in the home as a really high kind of moral position. Uh, that kind of leads me to a question real quick. Right now, uh, fourth graders in our district, we are learning about suffrages and the movement, okay. okay? The book that we are reading is entitled The Hope Chicks. In the book, the women who are against the movement are those women who say they should be in the home taking care of the family, the husband and the children. Now, Miss Pearson doesn't sound like that kind of woman. So why was she against the suffragist movement? Well, that is a really good question, and it's not, it's not gone into in this very short article. Okay. So you would want to do some research, because I think that's key. Supposedly, part of it was that she promised her mother on her mother's deathbed that she would, her mother was opposed to it. And that she promised her mother that she would. Well, this is. This is a whole lesson about listening to your mother, isn't it? Okay. Wow. It's a really great book. It's published about a year ago. It's called The Women's Hour. It's oh, okay. about just the last six weeks of the suffrage movement in Tennessee. That's oh, we'll have to check that out. And it's, yeah, it's, I've gotten halfway through it. Yeah. And it's fantastic. Okay. Well, thank you for that. All right, well, you're, you're doing your research on that, right? Well, I did. Okay. I did. I finished my master's and I, I did the women's suffrage. Oh, very cool, very cool. It's not really my background in terms of history, but you know, doing TPS, I've just learned so much about every single era of history. It's really great. I'm a medievalist, but um, yeah. Anyway, so and Ann Dallas Dugley, uh, what do we remember about her? She was obviously she was pro women's suffrage. She was president at the Tennessee Suffrage Association. She is from Nashville. She was one of these uh, elite. Uh, from an elite family, also well-educated. She was part of the NW, NAWSA, so NASA, and her children uh, actually were in the suffrage parades with her, and there's a picture of her reading to her kids because one thing, uh, one of the, the things that people would say against suffrage, suffragettes, uh, suffrage, suffragists to use against them was, was this, you know, they are throwing away their roles as wives and mothers. But then you have um, like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and, and, and you know, in the 19th century, and Anne Dallas, Douglas, Dallas Dudley, excuse me, being photographed as wives and mothers to be like, no, you can be proper wives and mothers and be for women's suffrage. So that was an important image 
to get across. And she had a lot more political involvement later in life. She's buried in Mount Olivet in Nashville. Okay, so these two women, Tennessee figures on uh, each side of the aisle here, um, kind of clashing at the Hermitage Hotel. This is the context in which we're gonna learn about Harry Byrne. And Harry Byrne was a very, very young, brand new Tennessee legislator. And of course, his, you know, one of his first things he has to do is vote on one of the most important things of his time. And um, I am going to pass out to you, uh, first of all, this original letter is in Knoxville with his papers. It's Byrne, Henry Byrne, uh, this, the McClung collection. So I want you to take a look. You don't have to read off of the original, but I always like to show students what these actually look like, whether they can read it or not. They need to kind of see what it is, where it is that we get our primary source information from. And I'm going to pass out to you a transcript of the excerpt that we will be concentrating on today. Would somebody like to read it out loud? I wish you were home too. We have had nothing but rain since you left. Meeting still in progress. I haven't been a single time. Uncle Bill and Mr. Bushnell came over this PM. Stayed about an hour. They were in the Ford. We haven't had the car out since you left. And if this rainy weather doesn't let up, I fear we will have to stay at home the rest of the summer. The Rockwood crowd is going to the White Cliff Labor Day. Will you be home by then? Hurrah and vote for suffrage and do not keep them in doubt. I noticed Chandler's speech. It was very bitter. I've been wanting to see how you stood but have not seen anything yet. Write mother every time you have a chance for I am always looking for a letter when you are away. Don't forget to be a good boy and help Mrs. Thomas Cat with her rats. Is she the one that put rat in ratification, <laughs> ah, no more from mama this time. With lots of love, mom. Hmm. What do you say, what do you think the tone of this letter is? Okay, so you see her as being strategic, yes. the way that moms certainly know how to, to manipulate their kids. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Um, I think she's playing off of their relationship, like, you mm -hmm. know, like, mm -hmm. I know you're working on all of this where you are, but remember this relationship we have because sometimes you probably forget, but she's like bringing them back home, setting them up with what's going on, and don't forget. And that's, how, that's how she got it. Uh huh. That's how she got it. Because if you don't vote you'll never get to ride in the Ford. All of your days will be right. Yeah. I know this looks like it's just an excerpt, but it doesn't seem like she's pounding it in. If she's kind of talking about it, she just throws it in there. Yep. In the, the weather, the yeah, yeah. relatives, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what, are they, what is she talking about with Chandler's speech? That's not something that I know a lot about. But I assume it was a politician speaking out either before or against uh, this so that might be something to have your students look into um also who is this mrs thomas cat person and why what what's the what's the rats vote i mean what's the rats joke there you know from the context you can kind of guess that this is a woman fighting for her rights to vote and so don't forget to be a good boy and because hi and she couches it as kind of a funny little thing. But yeah, and she's certainly kind of milking the mother-son relationship, like you said. Um, this is not a woman who has a political request from a politician. Uh, it's a lot easier to refuse a 
a female constituent than it is your mama. <laughs> right. Um, With lots of love, mama. Questions? Yeah. Okay, clearly she, she, she wants, okay, she has a way of getting a vote that she wants. She's trying to influence her son. Okay, there's something she wants. Her son has the power to vote for it. Yeah. Okay, so she writes a kind of lovely mother-son note, just throwing it in here and there. Why do you think uh, Abigail wrote such a stern letter to her own husband? Her letter, I mean, that's a conversation she could have had at home, but she chose to write him a letter. Well, he, was, he wasn't at home for a long time. She was in Braintree, Massachusetts, running the farm while he was off fighting, you know, fighting, founding the country. So why do you think it was so stern then? I don't, I don't think it was stern. I think that um, they wrote to each other very much as friends and equals. And I think that um, that's why I kind of hinted that she was a little bit like, you know, remember the ladies, John, you know, uh, kind of, this might be something that she had already talked to him about and is just kind of gently reminding him. Um, but it's, uh, I guess I'm basing my idea of what their relationship was like on the HBO miniseries, John <laughs> Adam, because it's so good. And Laura Linney does such a great job. Um, but I, I don't think it was meant to be stern. I think it was meant to be loving, but this was just the way that they talked to each other. Um, so, and I think it was more like a gentle chiding, but I am serious uh, at the same time. And so again, like how is it that women have to couch their requests to get men to do what they want? Uh, and so it's, it's kind of the theme for the day. Um, how, do you, how do you use what people have already agreed on to kind of get uh, what you want? So, I would also, I would kind of compare it to the relationship that I perceived between the Obamas. I mean, I feel like Michelle Obama, he really talks to her and that they have a, a positive marriage, but mm -hmm. they also share a lot of that political decision making, similar to the Adams. Okay, so, yeah, Michelle and Barack Obama seem like they treat each other as equals and as confidants and that they get advice from each other, um, which, you know. There's always a different president, first lady dynamic. Now you don't have to read the words on this. I actually blew it up a little bit bigger, but this has this nice little picture. I wanted to make sure that you guys got. This is a newspaper. Now, I tried so hard, guys, to make this easy to read. When you are looking at the website, you can zoom in and read these newspaper articles much more easily. So we know what happened. He voted for it. Tennessee got enough votes to be the, the state needed to ratify it. And then um, later that year, this article is released. So I'm going to give you some time to read it. Now, what I love about the letter and this newspaper article, well, one of the many things, is that it's at the kind of reading level that fifth graders might be able to handle, um, unlike previous newspaper article. Um, so this is something that uh, can really be used. Um, and the lesson, uh, the curriculum standard is, of course, 540. And of course, it can also be used in high school. Okay, so there are some suggested, suggested questions that you could pose to your students after they read these two. So one, uh, what reasoning did Harry Byrne give for supporting suffrage? How did his mother react to his vote? What political rep repercussions did he suffer because of his vote? And how might his political standing have changed once women could vote? And then it suggests that you have students do a skit and act out all the parts. Um, I, yeah, one of our graduate students did this because I never think of skits. 
that I'm doing less of. Um, so keeping some of those questions in mind and maybe asking some of your own, let me know how it is that you uh, find this newspaper article. Like what tone is it? What kind of bias do you think it may or may not have? What is the reason Harry gives? What's the reason that his mom gives for Harry? What kind of clues did you pick up about their background that might make this make sense or be surprising reactions? <laughs> and we didn't find that out to the very end, did we? Okay, so not only does his mom, uh, is his mom uh, a longtime suffragist, his fiance is a suffragist, but that's not the reason that he gives for why he voted. What does he say? Conscience. Women. Well, I like how the journalists <laughs> worded it. It would make like, other men be like, oh, he's a, like being swayed by women in his life. So, like, the people that aren't thinking how he's thinking, they'd be like, yeah. Or mad. Oh, yeah. The way absolutely is in all caps. I mean, it seems to me like this journalist was like, oh, well, now I finally have a reason that I can believe. So, I'm going to have it at the end as a zinger. Um, like it's like, oh, he just did this because his mom and girlfriend. So really, I mean, not much of a. It's like pretty much like saying, how much of a man or whatever. Yeah, I mean, how much of a man is he when his mom does all the talking, right? He doesn't really talk in all that. Boy, the journalist definitely was biased. Yeah, I was just, I was just attacked by the journalist to add in like a sentence that he said, and then all of the interview with the mom because I'm sure he said much more, but. He was smart in, you know, choosing to use the mother's words over. And you can ask your kids to like do this from the point of view of a journalist that like believed that it was right what he did. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Instead of right, like, yeah. right. How would they rewrite it? Yeah. I guess I interpreted it exactly opposite. Okay. Um, she is absolutely a suffragist. Like this is how he won her over in the end. Like wow, this woman's like man. This is the guy who gives us this amendment. I want to be with him because this article was written by Zoe Beckley. So probably a woman who wrote it. That's a really good detail. I still noticed that in the beginning too. But it was a woman. Or is, but is Zoe a girl name or boy name? Well, you know, nowadays it's a girl name, but it's really hard to tell. A lot of girl names used to be boy names. Um, and once you go girl, you never go back, apparently. But um, so, so that's interesting. Maybe she's his fiance because he supported. Maybe that's how they got together in the first place. But here's what I found interesting. Yes. Mom said that she only encouraged him to vote yes because she knew he already would. Well, if you knew that, why would you feel the need to encourage him? So I just, I don't, I don't know if Spoken I Spoken like a, yeah, this sounds like a mom to me. Oh, yeah. Oh, I was just nudging him to do what I knew he would have done anyway. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Well, and I picked up how much he and his mom read. Yes. Which means they yes. see the world and Tennessee. Right, right. Well, they're from a little farm. He hasn't even gone to college. The father is just mentioned is he's dead. Uh, and so the mother is obviously dominating the lives of these kids. But even though they're farmers in like McMinnville or something, sorry, McMinnville, <laughs> um, they're really well read. They're really well read. Mm -hmm. And the fact that that was pointed out specifically by the journalist with exclamation point. I thought it was like the part about the mom's fault if the child is ignorant. It's like oh, the mom yeah. believes that she <laughs> is like wanting him to choose like women's rights. But then it's like you're putting your child's ignorance solely on yourself. Like if they turn out. Well, you know, it's always the mom's fault, no matter what. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that's a backhanded way for taking credit for the fact that he's not ignorant. But then again, maybe she felt that way because her husband was deceased. Mm. And you don't know how long. Uh, she yeah, we don't know. We don't know how much she raised them by herself, or instead of the end, that she'd been like 
doing the cattle and the cleaning and the... Yes, and they are. Oh, and their pigs have very clean... So what what is some of the backlash that Harry Byrne has gotten? He's going to the suburbs. I'm sorry. You're right. He's, he's going to the suburbs of his fountain. Oh. Yeah, he's, he's not going to stay in the big city. Yeah. Just something that would be interesting to know, and if students could look up, is was he reelected after he did this? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a good question. He sounds like he's ready to like quit the political sphere and go start a business. But yeah, what did he do? Because he's very young, you know? Uh, he has his whole uh, life ahead of him, and I don't even know how long that he lived. And whether he wants to or not, mom is kind of helping with that decision also. Politics is just a horrible mess. He don't need that anymore. Come right. On. Right. We're doing all this at home. You need to come back to us. Yeah. It's like, well, well, think about it. When he goes up for re-election, there'll be a whole bunch of women who could vote for him. So that could be uh, in his favor. But the attacks probably yeah. coming from the past in the House. And also the fact that he's withstanding these political attacks, I mean, it might actually reflect well on his character. Uh, that you know he did this even though he knew that uh, he was not going to be received very well by a lot of people um, but you know this is the thing do you, when do you do what you know is right even though you know that you're going to be raked over the coals for it of course I think if he hadn't done it he would have been raked over the coals even worse by his mother <laughs> but they are pals I love that they are pals um, so I, this, this journalist was obviously very charmed uh, by their little family situation um, and, and thought that this would make a good story. And it certainly does make a good story, which is why it might be a fun thing to do a skit on. Um, so yes, what other, like wh what's, what is up with that limerick at the beginning? Why, why are you putting that into a newspaper article? Anyway, do you all know where on Nyota is? It's not McMinnville, I'm sorry. He's from Nyota. It's a really small town in East Tennessee. But I mean, it does point out that this was a surprise vote. And that's even mentioned later on where the vote was, you know, he switched it to uh, 49 to 47. So uh, he probably was going to vote the other way, or at least let out that he's going to vote the other way. And then at the last minute, so it, that kind of makes you believe that maybe his mother's letter was a little bit of a nudge, or at least helped uh, embolden him to follow his conscience, because we know how hard that can be. Um, now, other details in here. Uh, she does mention Mrs. Cat again. So does this make more sense of what the rats? <laughs> what are the rats? <laughs> She's like, I, maybe I shouldn't have used slang. So. Uh, but but why did why did she make that mention about Mrs. Cat? Yeah, yeah. She sees her part in this as um, kind of giving credit to Mrs. Cat, and also she knew that it would be something that Harry would respond to. Question: I kept trying to put Miss Cat into something that we've heard about already. And well, there's Carrie Chapman Cat, and I don't know if this is, I thought she was from before. No, it's the same, it's the same she one. She was involved for a while, okay. died, and then she got into it after his Okay, so this is Carrie Chapman Cat. There we go, I was just getting my timeline a little bit confused. So the rat, and she was throwing she figured he would get the message. Yes. That's what she was saying. She figured he would get it, he would understand. Yes. What she was saying with the rat and the ratification. So this story uh, obviously uh, has made its way to the national stage and it's also become a personal interest kind of story, you could say, uh, a mother and a son story. Um, so it is, this is, this is West Virginia 
people uh, who might be able to might be able to recognize the, the farm life aspect of it and certainly the, the mother-son uh, aspect of it. So that's a fun way to hear the woman's voice more than the men's here. And so he's the one who cast the vote. He's the one who's credited with you know, casting the vote needed for ratification. But it seems like the credit's really being given to his mother uh, as a suffragist. So here's another way that a woman is fighting for a woman's rights to vote and um, is just slightly different. Um, and, and, and she knew that he would make the right choice because from when he was a toddler, he was, um, what was it? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, he, he knew his newest state and he knew the cities. Yeah, right, right, so. Uh, he was, he was meant to do this from an early age. Okay, so that's basically uh, what there is to this little lesson idea here. And um, I would definitely recommend going onto Chronicling America and looking at the newspaper article on this, online, on the screen. It shows up much better that way. Um, but then you have the letter, which is not at the Library of Congress, but it's uh, from the McClung Collection. But you can at least see what it looks like. <laughs>